So in this in this paper, I said what we're going to do within the division is go back to first principles. And one of the, the first principle is that I heard a long time ago, and many of us have heard it, is if you take care of your people, they'll take care of you and everything else. Broadcasting from the center of the military universe, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. This is the 18th Airborne Corps podcast, the official podcast of America's Contingency Corps. Hey there, Joe Buccino here. This is the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting the show. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Today on the podcast, Major General Milford Beagle. He is the commander of the 10th Mountain Division on Fort Drum, New York. Been the commander there for about two months. General Beagle, he's known as Beags, is a really public general. He's out there with his message. He's authentic. He's transparent. And he is the portrait, really. He presents himself as a very humble leader. And we got into that in this discussion. You know, General Beagle gets out in the community outside Fort Drum. He's in the media often. He communicates with his troops in the community he serves. He's on social media. One thing you can tell is that he loves leading the 10th Mountain Division. There's no question about that. He and his wife, Pam, are from South Carolina, but they've served on Fort Drum previously. In 2017, he was the division deputy commander under General Walter Pyatt. And after that, he commanded the training command on Fort Jackson, South Carolina. General Beagle received his commission in the infantry after graduating from South Carolina State University in 1990. And he's gone on and had really all the infantry jobs that you'd want a general to have. He's led at every level. He's led uh, and commanded at every level. And, you know, he's one of the Army leaders that uh, has a lot to say, and he's one of the Army leaders that everybody has something positive to say about. So, you know, I wanted to have him on the show. He wanted to come on the podcast, and, and I think we had a great discussion about, uh, about leadership, about his priorities, about his family. And, you know, there's something in here for leaders all over the Army. So here is my discussion with General Milford Beagle. Well, you know, I know that uh, it's been 60 days. You took command on uh, July 12th, and we're coming up on uh, 60 days. It's certainly been an eventful two months, uh, really, for you, for 10th Mountain Division. You've had the emergency response in Afghanistan. You're dealing with, as we all are, dealing with the Delta variant, particularly the high-risk categories outside of uh, Fort Drum. Mandatory vaccine. You had a, a CPX, a computer exercise for your division headquarters. And you're assessing the organization in the meantime. So, you know, I think it'd be interesting an interesting time here to see what you've learned about your 10th Mountain Division, sir. Yeah, no, and, and those are all great points. You know, the one point you forgot to mention, I had to, you know, we had to take a son back to college, too. So mm. you, you throw that dynamic in the mix, that, that, that makes for some, some emotion, you know, in, in the household, everything else. But I, I'll tell you, given everything you said and everything that has occurred in the last 60 days, and I, and I tell people here, you know, on the installation, you know, it feels like six months. And, and I never say that in a bad way, because even though 60 days is, you know, fairly short, it truly does. feels like six months with all the things that have, that have gone on. But the, the learning curve for me, given, you know, familiar terrain with the division, the people, uh, it, it's, it's gained us a lot, you know, just by, by knowing that and knowing the capabilities and knowing the culture of the organization. And that's really what I've seen you know, highlight itself in spades is that, you know, mountain tough mentality that we always talk about, the the being ready, you know, aspect of things, you know, and we've demonstrated that over the past several weeks with the emergency response. And then, you know, that wraparound with the community. I mean, you know, a lot of engagement dialogue with the community and they're just as understanding as I remember it from before, as well as supportive and just the, the adaptability, you know, of the soldiers here to you know, whatever comes up, and, and even though, you know, we're, we're kind of going through the throes of the Delta variant, like you mentioned, uh, it, hadn't, it hadn't slowed things down. I mean, it's there, but, you know, again, and we, we, we battled through that, and, and watching that on top of everything else you kind of layered, you know, on that, that we've seen, like many others, very impressive uh, with regard to just the level of, you know, discipline, flexibility, 
adaptability by the, the, the soldiers, the families and the civilians here, you know, in the 10th mountain division. Mm. You know, it's interesting that, that with all this going on, you mentioned that yesterday you did, I didn't know this, you did a number of interviews yesterday. You're doing something, I think a town hall on Facebook after this. And, you know, watching this from afar, you're getting your message out there. You're on social media, you're a presence in Watertown, in the local news. So why is that important to you in this role? And have you always done that? Well, I mean, I, I started doing it, you know, once I assumed a senior command role and, and coming from Fort Jackson being there three years. I mean, that's where you kind of really accelerate your learning with regard to how important, you know, your engagement interactions, all those things are. So with, you know, three years of reps under my belt and then having seen it here uh, before, you know, arriving to Fort Jackson and then coming back here, you really see the value of it. And and watching the, the CG when I was here before at Fort Drum, you know, he did that very well. So just, you know, still in a lot of things out of his his kit bag and, and leveraging them and then kind of evolving things over time, you see the value in it. And when we talk about that civil military gap, it's a thing. And most people don't think it is when you think about, you know, what people, even those close to your, your fence line of installation really don't know or understand about, you know, what you do as a division, what, you know, soldiers do in the army, families, what they need, all those type things. And the key lesson that I really learned out of all this is if you don't tell your story, somebody else is going to tell it for you. And, and that's a position I think, you know, you never want to find yourself in. And, and as the face of the organization, you know, being a, the division commander, you know, same with my sergeant major, you know, we've got to tell that story. And, and we got to be pretty aggressive about it. And, and I always, you know, like to use the, the saying that you, you got to play in that space when the stakes are low. Because bad things are going to happen at some point in time or emergencies are going to come up where you need to have that, that stability with regard to credibility, trust, transparency with the community, because they're going to be in, able to help you. And then they'll be able to help, you know, tell a story and, and do certain things for you that, you know, you just can't do alone. So it is, it is very important to, to play in that space, both good times, bad times, and, and you're going to have to. It's inevitable. You know, you, you, it's interesting that looking through your, your command philosophy, your command philosophy is so rich in terms of, I think, for me, not really knowing you, painting a picture of who you are. At least until you know somebody gets to gets to know you and fully understand your personality, it, that there's a lot of you know good material in here about your leadership style, your family, your personality, things like that. And, and you value you value active listening, and I think that's clear when you go out and do these engagements and talk to people. So within that active listening, what are you hearing? What's the community telling you about Tenth Mountain Division? They're 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 telling me. Well, I would say they're they're telling me a lot. They're they're asking. And they're asking a lot of questions in that. And the questions are, are pretty much all along the same, you know, trend line, which is, hey, what can we do to help? You know, what do you need? And then that is a great position to be in when, you know, that level of understanding is already there. I'm, I'm just kind of bolstering it in, in terms of, you know, what I do, what we do as a team. But they, they really want to help. They want to understand more. They want to be a little bit closer to us because, you know, they, they see the challenges that we see. Um, the the support that we get is phenomenal, and and there's really not a lot of you know concerns just because I think there's there's always been a pretty good track record of our, our dialogue interactions with the community, and and when you have that you know they they really you know come to you in terms of hey, what what can we do to help you know what does the division need and understanding where we sit in the North Country and you know what Watertown looks like and the Tri County area around us is they they value having you know fort drum here and so they're always looking for ways to to help us out uh to be able to see you know what we're seeing from our, our foxhole and and so it's great when you can you know listen and figure out you know w what is it we need to to do or not do that um you know puts us at odds with anything that's going on in that tri-county area and i just said it yesterday to one of our local assemblymen you know i said things that are good for you know fort drum uh or good for the north country and vice versa they have to be Right. We, we never want to be at odds for, you know, things with regard to training. I mean, you know, encroachment, all those type of issues. And it, it is very good to hear, you know, those questions always come up in almost every single engagement I have you know, out in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do want to talk to you about your, your priorities in command and your priorities with your subordinate leaders. But, you know, I found this this document in this document, my commitment to mountain leaders. 
something that I thought was interesting. I know that you invest in the history of the 10th Mountain Division, and, and you find you know a lot of meaning in the division in Fort Drum. And there's the story. I didn't know this story, but and I pride myself on knowing knowing my history, but the founders of the 10th Mountain Division formed the Mountain Training Group and basically to, to form, man, train, equip, understand the employment of mountain warfare, organized for combat in that sense. And, and you have a nice parallel here, an interesting parallel, in terms of reorganizing the 10th Mountain Division for large-scale combat operations. And I'm hoping you can tell that story. I think it'll be enlightening. Yeah, so when, when the division was formed, I mean, and with this mountain training group, and it was it was actually started with the civilian, you know, Minnie Dole. And, you know, you go out, you get the right people, the right experts. But when they brought those soldiers in that were, you know, actually good skiers and good mountain climbers and good outdoorsmen type, when they brought them in, you know, they were all the lower enlisted. So now you need the officer ranks. And when they, they brought the officer ranks in, you put all that together, they, they had some pretty bad experiences with, you know, the training they were trying to do. And it boiled down to, you know, one simple thing is, you know, the, the leaders weren't listening to the lead and you get things like the D series in our history where, you know, the division was out to do an extended, you know, field exercise, those type things. And there was one even before that, that just didn't go well. And, and it's because those that, that really knew kind of like our NCOs today, our young soldiers that, that are out there day in and day out, you know, in that ring, you know, gaining a lot of reps and experience, you, you got to listen to them. You got to be able to figure out how to factor all that in. To, to get progress, to get movement, you know, forward for an organization. And that's where you kind of get that tie is as we, we shift and we start looking at different mission sets with LISCO and multi-domain operations. I mean, we got to listen and leverage that experience. We got to be able to open our ears and, and not forget that, you know, we, we've got some of those scars from our own history where we see those things didn't pan out. End of the day, the outcome, you know, panned out a little bit better, but, you know, it, it didn't have to go that way. If there was a bit more listening, a bit more understanding, just between the leaders and the lead uh, during that time. You know, on, on that point, the, the 10th Mountain Division opened the theater or helped open the theater as the first conventional force in Afghanistan, helped close the theater as among the last conventional forces out of Afghanistan. And that has been, you know, obviously the focus or a focus of our army for 20 years. Coming out of that now, as we're, we've closed out the mission in Afghanistan, how much work is there to be done to prepare the 10th Mountain Division for LISCO? Yeah, there, there's quite a level of work to be done, but I don't, I wouldn't categorize it as a lot, Joe. The the things that we, you know, have continued to do with the JRTC rotations that, you know, have been ongoing uh, in the past, simultaneous with, you know, deployments, uh, the ones that we have coming up, support to other missions. I mean, we just had a company come back from, you know, Chile, and then that was a, a field training exercise layered into that. So again, it connects us to our roots. It connects us a little bit to, you know, things that we'll see, different terrain, different countries, uh, you know, linked to LISCO and the other exercises that we've, we've developed, you know, over time for our aviation brigade, for our Devarty, have, have maintained a focus, you know, with regard to LISCO. Now, you know, we don't have to leverage our local training areas. We can use the upper part of the state, you know, to get that long, uh, you know, aerial routes and low, low level flying, you know, for our cab. And that's just working with the community. I mean, things that we want to do that get us more distance outside of our fence line uh, are all there and, and we're leveraging those things, but the repetitions are what we're really going to need. And, and that, you know, comes along with things that we're doing, you know, across our mission essential tasks for attack, you know, movement to contact, those type of things. We, we need the reps. Uh, fighting with fires is another good example uh, where we're going to need those reps that are a little bit different than what we've done in the past. But through our own internal training, the CTCs, you know, we're getting there. We just got to get, you know, better at it uh, a little bit quicker you know, through the repetitions. And within your priorities, people, readiness, leader development, quality of life, people is listed as your number one priority. Obviously, people first is our is our slogan for the Army and our focus. So how are you prioritizing people as you focus on LISCO? What, what, what does that mean to you, and, and how, what should, how should your subordinate leaders be thinking about putting people first? Yeah, so what I, what I did, Joe, is great you asked that question. I, I wrote a, a paper, a very short paper, you know, star note, that I'm going to put out tomorrow. Because as I go around and listen to the formations, there's still a bit of, you know, confusion, and, and what does that really mean, and, and how do we see it? And I don't think there's 
there's a, a perfect answer. The right answers are out there. I mean, if you look at core guidance, you look at force comp guidance all the way up to the chief, it, it's all there. But it, it's still hard for our subordinates at the lowest levels to figure out what that means and, 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 and sometimes to even communicate it. So in this, in this paper, I said what we're going to do within the division is go back to first principles. And one of the, the first principle is that I heard a long time ago, and many of us have heard it, is if you take care of your people, they'll take care of you and everything else. And, and that's really the first principle of it is you kind of turn everything else down a little bit. You know, don't try to look at it on that spectrum of, you know, is it time off to is it, you know, something else? It's just take care of your people. And, and one of the ways to do that, which is resonating, you know, with my commanders and command teams is, you know, when you talk about readiness, P, S, and R equals T. And, and we kind of use that equation to, to get us there because we take care of the P in that P, S, and R, you know, with our, with our people, dental readiness. I mean, all those type things uh, that, that allows us to get at, you know, better training over time because there's no distractors. Nobody's on the bench per se. Everybody can play. We can put every every soldier on the field. When you look at simpler things, it talks about our reception, our integration. I mean, every newcomer's PT, I mean, I do, or the Sergeant Major, or one of my DCGs, I mean, the newcomer's briefs, I mean, we're all there, spouses are there, and, and, and it links to that too. It's doing those things right. And that that will allow us to, you know, keep that priority number one, take care of people in, in multiple ways without making it overly complex and maple making you know leaders feel like they're they're burdened to do a whole lot of things it just they just boil it down to that simplicity of you know take care of your people and however you do it i mean you're probably going to get it right get it more right than you get wrong you get, it's going to take care of everything else everything is just going to be exponentially better to include our training yeah yes sir and in terms of it, really everything you're talking about here, you know, a factor, I don't know how big of a factor is COVID, but, you know, we're a year and a half into this now. I think perhaps it's just uh, a part of uh, everything that you're talking about. And it's part of life and service in any Army unit. I know we have a little bit of uh, COVID fatigue here on Bragg. I guess everybody probably does. So how big of a factor? I mean, the Delta variant is new, but it's still COVID. How big of a factor is COVID? How much time do you spend on this problem? We about daily. I mean, we you know we we talk about it. We're we're past the point of you know daily cubs, you know commanders updates, things like that. But we we pull them in when we really need it, when we know we need to get ahead of something and kind of set the conditions so it's not as big of a disruptor to what we're doing, you know, day in and day out. So I'm pretty sure just like you know a lot of other divisions. I mean, weeks before you know kind of getting the read on. It, this, the mandate's going to come out for, you know, vaccines, mandatory vaccines, then we're, you know, we're huddling, trying to figure out, like, how do we make this better? How do we set the conditions so that we, we can smoothly, you know, uh, operate uh, when, when that mandate does come down and not let that detract from everything else? And, and I think I'm, I'm very pleased with just how everybody has adapted to it. I mean, to go back to mask indoors, those type things, not really an issue. I mean, in terms of public facilities, you know, you hadn't seen a lot of just, you know, hand wringing and and consternation about that, you know, whatsoever, which which is very good to see as we flowed into this week, just with bringing everybody in, you know, for first dose, the second dose type things, and then trying to figure out, okay, who's who's not going to want to take the vaccine? That That is going well also, because at least it gives us, you know, the ability to account for who's, who's who and, and who's going to be in kind of what category as we go forward and being able to explain that. And, and so just taking that time to set the right conditions for, you know, the soldiers, the families, has made things, you know, really smooth. I mean, I wouldn't say as smooth as they can possibly be, but they've made them a lot smoother as, as we, we deal with everything else. Yes, sir. You know, on a, on a kind of a more personal note for you, I know your son Jordan, I've never met him, but he's a, uh, he's a captain in infantry. I believe he's a company commander in Fort Benning. Is that is that right, sir? Right, that's correct. So he, he's a, a first lieutenant P. We're just waiting on him to to pin the railroad tracks, but he's, he's a company commander down at Fort Benning for uh, OSA. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. And I imagine you're just in daily contact with him. Is he looking, does he kind of come to you for leadership, or does he focus on his career, you focus on yours type thing? What, what's, your, what's your relationship with him, sir? Yeah, so, I mean, our, our relationship is awesome. I mean, it, it's great. I mean, he, you know, he spent most all of his life traveling around point to point, you know, place to place. But it's, it's like any other parent, right? I, Dad can tell son something. And, you know, don't quite believe it right off the bat. Uh, you, Joe could tell my son something. He's like, oh, that's great. That's like awesome idea. Never heard that. I'm like, And I can say, I just told you that like two days ago, you know. So it takes a little bit of 
and that's not with everything, but you know, kind of in general, uh, is this, and we, we laugh about it. That's something we do talk about, uh, you know, often, but, but he will, when, when things are, you know, tough for him or he knows, you know, I've got the experience in it. He, he will, you know, call me up and, and we'll have the discussion. I'll kind of walk him through and here's things to think about. And, and he tries on his own. I mean, I think like most, you know, military connected kids that are, you know, serving, you know, they, they try to do it on their own. And that's one thing I do admire about him is, you know, he, he tries to do a lot on his own. He's not going to wait to break glass in case of emergency. He, he knows a little bit better now to, to not let things run completely off the rails before he calls me. And, but he'll call me when he knows he's close, when he's got to pick up that hammer, uh, he'll, he'll call me, uh, before things really get, get out of whack, but he, he is doing so well. I'm very proud of him. And the, the thing that I told him going in, I said, if you got to get first sergeant, you're going to be, be fine. And, and he does, he has a great first sergeant and that first sergeant is coaching him and teaching him, you know, what right looks like in a commander. And I couldn't be more proud of, of the two of them, you know, as a team. And, and then Jaden just went back to, I believe, South Carolina state. That's correct. Yeah. Took him back. And he's, he's a senior there. And then, uh, I guess no military ambitions for Jaden, sir. Is that, uh, or, or you don't know? No, he, he's, he's, he's the 180 out. So he's a sociology major. Uh, if you were to see his hair, I mean, it's, it's probably down to his shoulders. I mean, uh, he doesn't want to cut that. So he's kind of, you know, on his own path, but, but very, very smart, very proud of him. Uh, I, I, I tend to tell him he's kind of got a bit of a political mind, not sure where he gets that from, but that's, you know, kind of the area that interests him and, and, and all those things. And, and he did at one point in time, we actually thought he was going to be the, be the West Pointer because that's all he talked about as a kid. And then his brothers kind of think he looks at it and stole that dream from him. So he's pursuing a different path, but, but a great path. I mean, you know, that he's, he's on. Yes, sir. And, and you know, I, the only reason I ask you these things, not to pry on your personal business, but you do talk about your family a lot. You're proud of, of both of your sons and your wife, your family. And I think, you know, people, I think personalize you or it helps, it helps your, your subordinate leaders, your soldiers personalize you. I've heard people talk about it because you do talk about your family a lot in terms of, you know, it, it's relation to your personal life, your leadership, and it's all kind of tied together with you. You're, you're, you present yourself as a humble leader, and I think that the, the tie to your family there personalizes that, sir. Yeah, no, and, and it goes back to, again, you know, where you come from. And I, I often say, you know, how you grew up I and mean, how you were made. I mean, uh, the people that made you, and not only personal life but in the Army, but, I mean, a very humble beginnings i have no issues telling people you know i grew up in a trailer you know the not quite a trailer park but just very humble beginnings and you go through things in life where you know you you experience you know not having lights or not having you know power you know in that sense or other things but not being you know dirt poor but you you really appreciate everything that you have in life and everything that you gain and, and I've, I've bumped into more leaders in my career you know same type same type way and that, that really shaped me. My, my spouse, I mean, she, she has been in the Army longer than I have because my father-in-law is a, a retired CSM. So she's been, you know, bouncing around the globe her entire life. Plus, you tack on 30 years, you know, that we've been together. And, and that, I think, connects to people because most people don't assume, yeah. you know, when they see you at a certain rank, there's no way you could have came from, you know, those kind of beginnings. You're like, oh, yeah, my dad was a truck driver and my mom worked in a factory. So, um, you know, that, that just creates you and shapes you in a different way. And, and, and I'm not by any means ashamed of that and laying those stories out to people because you'll find a lot of people have very similar stories. When, when I see the way that you present yourself and even, and also, um, you know, Sergeant Major Karinas as well, you know, the way you two present yourself, him obviously before you got there, but, but I think you've been doing it for a long time. You know, there's value in just in a leader in just being real. You know, in just being your authentic self to, to the world and to the army and to the civilian community that we serve and to your soldiers. I, I think, um, you know, I, I don't know if that came to you late in your career, but I think you, you present yourself as, as just an, your, your authentic being. And I think there, there just seems to be a lot of value in that. Yeah, no, and that didn't come to me late. It came to me early. And the one thing that's hard for a lot of us to get comfortable with is being vulnerable. You know, and I think that's what, you know, kind of creates that barrier where, you know, you don't, you don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to be, you know, you don't know something or you, you're you not the smartest guy in the room. And I've never had that problem. And, and again, I go back to my father-in-law. That's the thing that he told me, you know, coming in is like, just listen, listen to your soldiers. They'll take care of you. And that was absolutely true. And then, and I, and I learned in spades, you know, to go to a soldier and go, 
hey, look, I don't know this. I need you to show it to me. And the pride they take in that, you know, I talked to Lieutenant something or I talked to Captain something. And, you know, you just go on and on and on uh, that it, it, it no longer makes you vulnerable, you know, in that sense. It does make you real to people. And I think that's what, you know, sometimes hurts us as leaders is we, we, we don't want to be vulnerable, whether that be in front of, you know, our soldiers or our community. But we're, we're human just like they are. So we audio and video has got to match. So if I say I'm, I'm human just like you are, then I, I've got to show some of those cracks in my armor. And then they believe it. If not, then they're, they're never going to believe you in that sense. In that sense. Mm. And, and on that point, sir, you've had an incredibly successful career in the, in the top, you know, 1% of your cohort of since coming in the Army. And so, you know, what were some of the early experiences where you were not as successful that, that shaped you? What were some of the things that you reflected on that build you out as the leader you are today, sir? The... I think the first was my first duty assignment, and I wouldn't call it, it wasn't a failure by any means. It was a fact of things I didn't understand or I didn't get or didn't appreciate. And and I tell leaders now, I said, you know, it's not about where you go. It's about what you do, wherever you get assigned. And, and I tell that to every leader. Don't don't try to pick a place and go, you know, if I get to, you know, post X or Fort X, I, everything's going to be great. I'll be a great performer. And, the, and I learned that my first assignment, I got Fort Polk, Louisiana. And I literally, Joe, got there and cried. I called back to my grandma and cried on the phone, you know, because I'm like, I don't know where the Army sent me. The Army hates me, and this place is in the middle of, like, nowhere, you know, and life is just going to be miserable. And she kind of, in, in, in so many words, told me to get get over myself, get over my attitude, and, and do what the Army had taught me to do. And she had no experience with the Army, but, you know, just simple things, simple lessons. And that was probably the, the greatest assignment, you know, I could have ever had because you, you and, I, and I grew up playing a lot of sports, but... I was, it, it freed me up to go play. I mean, and just, just get on the field and play and leave it there every single day. And, and things started there. I mean, from, you know, first job as platoon leader to next job to next job, all the doors started to open because, you know, I wasn't worried about the place. I wasn't worried about my career or what was going to happen. So I learned that, you know, very early. And uh, another funny story for you, uh, my first interaction with the battalion commander, because every officer got the, the opportunity to go, meet the battalion commander and I watched my peers go in and out and they were in like within like five minutes, you know, just in and out. And it was all, you know, just initial introductions. And so somewhere in my mind, I, I figured out or thought these guys were doing things wrong. And so when I went in, you know, reported in, you know, give your name, all that kind of stuff. I got two things out of that. And he said, you know, what do you, what do you go by? And I said, I don't go by Milford because nobody calls me that. And I said, I go by Beagle playing sports. That's what the coach call you. Everybody else is on my name tag. So that's kind of what I go by. And he said, well, that's not going to work. And, and he, so he started calling me Beads. So I got, I got the name from that first interaction. And then he said, what, what do you want to do in your career? And so, Joe, I literally pulled this out of my fourth point of contact. I said, I want to be a general officer. And so, uh, and it got me kind of what I wanted. He said, okay, we'll take a seat. And I took a seat. And 40 minutes later, I walked out of that office. And I'm like, holy cow. And one, you know, I'd said something that wasn't probably partially, you know, fully true. But he took 40 minutes to have that conversation with me. And, and he started out by saying, look, I'm not a general officer. I don't aspire to be one, but I'm going to tell you some things that, you know, may help you get there if that's your goal. And just once I walked out, given the fact that he spent 40 minutes with me, I'm like, now that's a goal I really got to pursue. Uh, and I just kind of threw that out there. But I, I got what I wanted. I stayed in longer than my than my peers did. And when I came out with me later on, they thought I did something wrong because I stayed in much longer. But, but I, you know, two valuable things I got out of that, a nickname and, uh, I think a path set for me, you know, by one lieutenant colonel type battalion commander. Well, it's, it's a great story, sir. You know, it's uh, really, I think, obviously a formative experience for you. Um, and, and as you approach, you know, your subordinate leaders and, and uh, you know, you look at your company commanders, first sergeants and below, what should they primarily be focused on? Where do you want them to focus primarily? One, I tell them to focus on, you know, their skills, being good at what you do, uh, whether it be, you know, a lieutenant and just like this morning, talking to newcomers. And that, that same question came up and I said, whether it be related to your MOS, be, be technically proficient. Nobody's going to ask you at your level to do more than you're required to do. Granted, we ask people to fleet up a little bit, you know, based on, you know, ranks and some gaps in our formations, but nobody's going to ask that lieutenant. So I'm not going to ask you about strategy, I mean, but I want you to be very good at you know, technical, tactical aspects of what you've learned in school, and then we're going to groom you from there. So don't put an extra burden on yourself uh, to be fit is the other thing. And I, I laid out the statement 
that I heard, you know, as well a long time ago is, you know, no soldier should cry from the grave. You know, I wasn't trained and I wasn't fit. And we can provide that to everybody. We can train you and we can keep you fit. So that was, you know, the second thing, you know, I laid out when I got that question. And then the other thing is, you know, just be a good leader, be a good person. And I said, that's, that's one thing I want you all to be is just be a good person, you know, and, and we, we say that a lot, but you have to keep saying it because, you know, it's, it's how you talk to people, how you treat people, even when you're angry, upset, it, it means something and that's going to carry a long way. So those are you know, three points I dropped this morning based on that exact same question. Well, you know, sir, I, I do want to uh, thank you so much for your time here. I want to be, you know, respectful of your time because I know you've got this uh, town hall uh, coming up and, uh, you know, obviously towards the end of the day, busy schedule here. So, you know, if there's any kind of note that that uh, we can close on here, that's uh, your your message beyond 10th Mountain to, to the broader, you know, Army 18th Airborne Corps. There are a lot of people who listen to the show who are, you know, middle career kind of middle management of the army, sir, you know, your field grade officers. Um, what's your broader message to the force, sir? Yeah. The, the thing I would say, and, and again, I go back to, you know, things I, I, I generally say, kind of stay on your, on your message, right. Is, is be optimistic and look at the things that you get to do. And I told everybody in that room and they, and then even at PT with the newcomers, they looked at me with a surprised look. And I said, you know, there's two things you have to do in life. At least we were told you have to die and you have to pay taxes. And I said, but one of those is not true. I said, you know, there's a lot of people that don't pay taxes. And, you know, we, we have to die at some point in time, unfortunately. But you have to make choices every single day. And I said, none of you have to be here. And I got this big look from some. I said, you don't. Think about it. You, you don't. You, didn't, you could have hit the snooze button, and you didn't have to show up to PT. We typically don't like those consequences. But you have to look at things. This is what you get to do every single day. I mean, everything you, 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 you volunteered, you're on the team, you got the jersey, and this is what you get to do every single day, uh, regardless of what kind of day you're having, what kind of environment you're in. You know, it's, it's all about you. It's, it's your piece, your part, and keeping your, your mindset right. And so the four things you got to show up with every day is, you know, right, right place, right time, right uniform, right attitude. And I said the attitude is, is your choice, right? And you got to make the choice based on, you know, what you get to do. You get to come to PT. You get to sit in this newcomer's brief, not necessarily listen to me, but, but you're doing something that a lot of folks don't necessarily get to do. And it's always about, you know, what you get to do every single day. And I get this opportunity to interview with you, so it doesn't take any time for me. This is something I get to do, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to do it. Well, sir, you know, we were just were happy and honored that you did do it. And uh, thanks for such a great uh, positive message and for all your leadership. And obviously, our uh, you know, our best uh, out to the entire 10th Mountain Division for drums, sir. All right. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. And climb to glory. Climb to glory, sir. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay, that was a great discussion with General Beagle. You know, there's a lot to think about there in terms of leadership, in terms of his priorities. And, you know, like I said up front, and like I said during the interview, frankly, he, he's a, a candid leader. He's a transparent guy, not afraid to be vulnerable, humble. And he's obviously, you know, so proud of his, his family, his service, and he's so proud of his 10th Mountain Division. So, all right, I want to thank you all for listening. And uh, please continue to listen. Subscribe to the show if you have not done so. And please leave a five-star rating and a review for the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. Thank you so much.